Surprise! Surprise! This is the new way of doing it. Hi, friends. Your hosts, Rachel and Eric, are here today asking the provocative question Are ISTPs the most serious type? And Rachel and I both answered the question yes. Mm -hmm. I think the answer is yes. You might say, don't jump the gun, Eric. Don't answer the question right away. Hi, Ron Allen Salon. <coughs> don't run, yeah, don't run out right away. Don't run out right, right away to answer the question. I'm going to go ahead and answer it right away because why? I expect there to be a little bit of pushback about this. I'm going to say yes. I am taking my position on this is yes. ISTPs are the most serious type. Yeah. Frequent, yeah. I, well, let's look at Gen X Seal as an example. Example of all the things Gen X Seal says. What percentage of those things are jokes? Point one, one percent, maybe one percent. Yeah, one percent. I can. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. See you, Karma Spam. I know. For those of you who just came here for the answer, the answer is yes. You can go ahead and continue <laughs> on with your day. Um. No reason to stick around. I've already answered the question. If you want to talk about other things as well, that's fine. But uh, the answer to the question is yes, ISTPs yes. are the most serious type. Yes. And Genexial is my evidence. Okay. Genexial makes only 1% of his statements or jokes. Well, more than 1% of my yeah. statements or jokes, at least 10%. My uncle is uh, ISTP and he can, he finds things funny, but he's not very funny. Right. Occasionally, you know, this yes, is the thing about polar. Like, this is the thing about polar is like every once in a while, yeah. an ISTP will say something funny and hilarious. And yeah. Make you laugh. Every once in a great while. Yeah. And it's it's, memorable. it's extra memorable and funny because it's so rare. Mm -hmm. But by and large, ISTPs don't have time for jokes. Okay. Jokes are for, for kids. There's nothing nothing important to do. Yeah, ISTPs are busy. Okay. ISTPs have Fortnite to play. Yep. They've got to play Call of Duty. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree with what Rachel was saying there, though. It's not like they they don't enjoy funny things. I think they enjoy funny things. Yeah. Funny, but they're never, they never really make an attempt to be funny. Oh. ISFPs are also not prone to make an attempt to be funny. But I see them, see them as less serious because they're more emotional. So I see that as basically less serious, I guess. As less serious? Yeah, I think so as well. Like if you if you you really don't want to make an ISTP enemy, like you don't you don't want to become targeted by an ISTP as the bad guy to get. Oh my god! Because they're so I no serious, you know they're so <laughs> serious. It's so stupid. It would be well, like it depends how bad the person they're after is, really. Yeah, that's true. But like sometimes I feel like I'm under that category now, and I have like no reason to be because I'm. I did everything I could. What? Because you broke up with an ICP? Yeah. Well, you know, your ex ICP hasn't seemed to uh, chase after you or anything. No. So I don't know. I I think they they move on fairly quickly they do counter value si so they don't spend a lot of time in their memories well what i imagine is that he just like shits on me you know like oh whatever that girl which is i'm fine with i mean he might uh he might also uh because like he didn't really like i can't really say he liked me when we were even dating like, it was weird. Like, that's why I think activity partners don't really, I don't know, whatever. But, um. Well, I mean, I, in some sense, I got the sense that ESFJ wife didn't exactly like me either, since she was constantly trying to um, <laughs> fix me, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that that was my experience was, was a sense of constantly being fixed. Yeah, I had that too. I really didn't think that he liked me that much. I, I did question while we were together. We were only together for three months. Um, I questioned. I was like. The most serious three months of your life. It was so serious. A lot of serious. Okay. I said, so I met him December 14th. His mom invites me to Christmas Eve. And I'm like, look, that's a little quick for me. Um, 
why don't I meet them at a different time? He would, he was so serious that like, he was so upset that I said no to Christmas Eve. Like it was like such a big deal. Clint Eastwood is a good example of an ISTP character yeah. in general. Yeah. Maybe him himself, but definitely like, you know, in, uh, what was that, that movie you made about the car? A uh, Gran Torino. Gran Torino. Yeah. Definitely an ISTP in mm -hmm. that movie. Um, yeah. great movie, hardcore or hard to watch. It, uh, yeah. It, it has some scenes that really stick with you in an ugly way. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, he did play a great cowboy. Played a great cowboy, played a great, like, gritty detective or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's, you know. Gritty guy. And he was a good director as well. It's interesting because when you hear him speak publicly, like, when he briefly sort of spoke publicly about politics, he didn't sound particularly cogent, you know. But it may have been the circumstances, I guess. True. Uh, no. Well, cogent. What does that mean? Like logically put together. Oh, he probably isn't logically put together. Well, the characters he plays, he definitely plays ISTPs a lot, but he may not yeah. actually be an ISTP himself. You know, he may not be an STP. He may be an SFP, maybe a ah uh, SFJ SFPs, or something. Listen, you know. SFPs are good actors. What else are or you an STJ. STJs, you know, ESTJs can end up doing anything because they don't get the idea in general that things should have an NI mad to them. Like, so, you know, my dad, he's an ESTJ. He was in the Navy, then the Army. He played the French horn of all instruments. Mm -hmm. um, he coached wrestling. He raced Mini Coopers. He got a PhD in philosophy. <laughs> and then he he worked as an administrator in special education and a census director, and his hobbies include rid ridiculously and unnecessarily and displeasingly complicated jazz and um, astronomy. And he gets like these uh, the planetary report newsletter all the time. Mm. It's like what a random mishmash of shit, you know? It really is. And he's really knowledgeable about politics and history, of course. But yeah. He taught poli sci at American University for a while as well. So I think he did. Yes, TJs, you see, actually, you're right. You see a lot of them actually in uh, shows as comic relief. There are a lot of times like they'll play that type A character, and it's so audacious that um, it's funny. Um, <laughs> well, Akula. That sounds like an indictment of the test. Um, are to be the most underrated, underrated type? Yes. I, I definitely say they are. And the reason is because of my own personal experience, of course. With the ENTPs, it really helps to have an exemplary experience to explain to yourself why something is whatever. So for me, that exemplary experience is... Uh, when I worked with an ISTP student trying to coach him on interview skills. I never really could improve his interview skills at all because ultimately interview skills boil down to extroverted intuition, most of all. Um, and, uh, and so I never really could improve on those. But the reason he needed inter interview skills was because he had gotten a perfect score on the ACT. Only a couple of thousand kids out of the whole country do that, wow. out of the millions and millions who take it every year. That's impressive. Um, and he was, you know, he had perfect 4.0, whatever, 4 point something GPA and was applying to places like Harvard and Yale. Um, so naturally, it's only if you go to places like that or apply to places like that that you actually are subjected to an interview. Mm -hmm. Most colleges, the vast, vast majority of them, like 99.99% of them, don't have an interview process. That kid, if you had asked me um, to just talk to him randomly, not know anything about him, and come back to you and report to you on his intelligence or intellectual competency, I would have reported uh, very low, <laughs> low potential, uh, not smart, you know, because I. I would have assumed that 
intelligence always goes along with some sort of ideational vigor. Mm. They are ideationally as flaccid as mm. as a puddle of water, but it doesn't matter in, when it comes to the TI. My my fifth now sixth grade ISTP girl student that I work with, I've been teaching her conditional logic. She's doing a fantastic job. We're on like three three variable conditionals and biconditionals, and she's able to successfully take a long sentence like, um, if it is the case that, if it is not the case that not, that Barry doesn't have any roles and Judy has no figs, then either Bob or Joe has cheese, then yeah, like yeah multiple, it's it, really it's complicated. She's really she's complicated able to do stuff. It, I li know? I listen to it and I'm like, whoa, like this is like college level stuff. Like really. Well, it is it is basically um, conditional logic 101. I'm teaching her how to do how to first. I'm doing uh, conversions from sentences mm -hmm. into um, into uh, symbolic representations, and then eventually to do proofs. But, but can they do jokes? No, no, not really. Not really, no. Like, um, one instance was, like, my, my uncle, he likes the, a peaceful life, right? He, he has, he lives in a big property upstate New York. Um, he likes to ride his lawnmower and take care of the pool and, He's known for being out in the shed. He used to be a drummer. Like, um, STPs make the best drummers. Do they? Yeah. Uh, yeah, apparently he was great. My dad said he was, like, fantastic. Um, but, like, he has this, like, like no-nonsense uh, attitude. Like, even when, I, even when I was little and used to sleep over, he would always be the one who was annoyed that I was sleeping in late. Like, here I am. I'm like, I'm the guest. I'm like, I just want to sleep in. Well, here's the thing with ISTPs. If uh, you say to them, you know, why did the chicken cross the road? And you tell them the punchline to get to the other side. And ISTP will say, that makes good sense. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the famous... ISTP drummer? I don't know. I, I say STPs are the best drummers because, again, SI. I, <laughs> I, I, well, he, you know, he, I, my dad said, my dad, uh, who worked alongside with my uncle for years, they were in a band and my dad tried drumming and he was, he thinks he's great. He has no rhythm at all. But um, <laughs> he, did say that when he was in the band that my uncle Tom also played drums and he was fantastic. Like he could have, you know, gone. The reason is because drums are the instrument that requires you to avoid extroverted intuition as much as possible. In other words, it's always NISE. Find the right beat for this and just play it straight through mm -hmm. um, is how it's supposed to be with drums. In other words, you're not trying out new things while you're playing drums. You're executing a given drum beat and then changing for the chorus or whatever and then changing back to the original beat. Yeah. Um, as an NTP, the other thing is extroverted intuition in the dominant slot, I suspect whether it's NFP or NTP, means that you have a hard time with, uh, with being like a metronome. In other words, uh, there's something about extroverted intuition dominant that is NE, NI ignoring that makes you go close enough. Yes. And but, so you have to you have to really work on that if you're a musician that, and in, in E Dom. Yeah. My my rhythm's pretty good now, uh, mm -hmm. but it's after many, many years of playing and and also playing under the sort of watchful eye of an INFJ whose rhythm was rock solid. Corey's rhythm was always, you know, what he'd do is he'd practice the same thing over and over and over again until it was perfect. What I'd do is I'd continually change what I was playing all the time, you know? And so I learned from both observation and direction that I'm ruining shit by 
by not letting it be what it is, you know, I'm still, I still wrestle with that. I still wrestle with exactly what the, the, the strumming pattern for certain songs are. And when I, when I finally reach, when I have songs where I finally reach a certainty about that, and I know exactly how to play, I play exactly the same way every time. Um, that's a very gratifying experience. And in those circumstances, I can always know how well I played something. But that's not, it's only the case for still some of my songs. I'm still sort of working out how I, I want to play things because I spend so much more time historically making new stuff and so much less time practicing stuff I've already made. That's starting to change a bit, though. Yeah, that's, I mean, that people grow, in my opinion. If an ICP tells a joke, what kind of joke will they tell? Okay. It'll surprise you. It, it will surprise it'll you. It'll be like in the middle of a regular conversation or something, and they'll surprise you with some really dry comment. Like a, like a, go, Hold on like a, a zinger. Did almost. you just make a joke? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And you'll remember it. So, like, yeah. my uncle made this joke about we were playing uh, Scrabble, and we had literally someone had, I think he had a set where you couldn't make a word at all. So he wrote Zaz it, like, that's it. Like, he was done with the game. And it was hysterical because, like, that's <laughs> it, <laughs> you know? But, but you know, um, other instances I can't think of. What do you mean sounds more like what an ISTJ would do? What, what are you talking about? I mean, I can explain to you how ISTJ and E plays out. Um, Cameron actually makes a fair number of jokes compared to an ISTP anyway and enjoys expertly intuiting. Sure. It's just that you really get the sense that when he hangs out with us. Uh, he feels liberated to extrovertedly into it a lot more. And we'll talk a lot about, you know, ideas about maybe scooters and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> ideas about People things. People who are buying from him, what they're doing with the scooters. Ideas he has of stuff that we can do. Yep. Like, yep. we should go to this, uh, tube I know of which has a lot of um, acoustic reverb and make a, a video in there yes. with the sound. That's right, that's he has a lot of, of, of kind of actually quite good ideas, good ideas. for video making um, that are very physical as well. They're like uh, we should go ride scooters over here and film it. We should, you know, it's like uh, yeah. it is very physical. And you can also you see the third slot FI with him where he um, he's he's sort of taking charge of taking care of us a little bit. Like uh, he'll say, "Well, next time when I come over, we'll definitely fix that that flat tire of yours." Oh my gosh! You know? <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so funny. I mean, it. It will be great to have that. It will be fake. It would yeah. be nice to have fixed. And you know, so it's like you wait for me to rides. do it. It could be six months. It could be. Well, and I'm I'm not gonna ask because <laughs> wait, there's always that video. If you want to know how I roll regarding stuff like that, there's always that video when I lived in Temple City of me taking down the Christmas lights in June. <laughs> well, friends, it's June. You know what time that it means. It means it's time to take down the Christmas lights. I did that. I did that. <laughs> Oh, I love you. Winston's mom makes a lot more jokes than Genexio. See, yes, like, yes. About I would say, so Winston's mom gets three points, and Genexio gets one point for humor. Well, you know, I want to go back to this issue of uh, metronomicness, metronomicness, or whatever. You know, being steady with your beat and stuff. So. It's like a lot of people when they first start playing instruments, and this is definitely the case for me, it took me a long time even to be steady with a metronome. Uh, in fact, it took me a long time to be able to play with just a metronome, with just a click track. Uh, for, for quite some time, I had to have more of a beat underneath it in order for me to stay in time with the beat back when I first started playing. But then I played with a band for a number of years, Puppy Bus, and um, 
my rhythm got a lot better. Uh, my pitch was always good. My pitch was always good. But, was your, um, your pitch always good since, like, you were in the choir? Since, since I auditioned for the choir. Wow. I remember the day I auditioned for the choir and the choir director kind of beaming at me because the choir Aww. audition was basically a test of can you match intervals. And uh, I had no problem matching all the pitches and the intervals, no problem. That's so cute. And, uh, and I remember him like being like, "Wow, that's really, really good. You're you're definitely in." And me thinking like, "Oh, that was easy. I don't. I expected this to be something. You know, it was tryouts, right? I figured we're gonna have to try hard, hard to do it, you know. But it just turned out to be right in my natural wheelhouse. What they were asking. So, um, <clears throat> I also won or. I really won, but um, sort of pretend, pretending to lose out of a sense of, I was concerned people wouldn't believe me, but uh, I also won the the longest, the most breath control of, in the whole choir. Like, uh, oh, wow. they start everybody singing a note uh, and then see how long you can continue singing it. And I could do that longer than anybody else. You're Mr. Mighty Lungs. So I had natural choir choir abilities, but I didn't have very good rhythm, and the choir didn't help me with that very much. So uh, the the choir director played the piano, <coughs> and the other choir director <coughs> would use the baton, and. I don't know. I just didn't really ever, don't remember ever thinking about rhythm really when I was playing when I was singing in the choir. Um, but I was also always second seat in the choir. Like uh, I, there was one boy named Lauren. He was the lead soloist, and he was. I never. I got. I got the scrap solo, leftover solos. So I had the experience of both, like. Having um, having high, very high status in the choir, like you know, in any any group like that, if you're good at that thing, you have high status. Like mm -hmm. amongst debaters, if you're a winning debater, you have high status. And it, other other things that might factor in a lot to high status in high school or something uh, are irrelevant amongst debaters. So, you know, you might be. Um, a, a chubby girl with acne, but if you're the if you're the national champion, every guy's after you at debate camp. <laughs> it works both directions in with in the debate world. Like you know, it doesn't matter what kind of a scrubby, messy looking dude you are with glasses. If you're national champion debater, you got your choice of all the chicks at debate camp. You know, so it, it's a funny it's funny the way that different environments. Uh, they're so specialized, begin to to define status in that environment around that specialization, you know? Yeah. I never went to debate camp, personally, unfortunately. But uh, I did go to choir camp. However, it was a boys' choir. So <laughs> there, were, <laughs> there weren't any girls to be impressed by my singing. Well, I, I went to an all-girls camp, so... Both you and me never had experiences like that with camp. Yeah. But I really enjoyed choir camp. Uh, I know. It was a lot of fun. I, I remember I remember those experiences well. Uh, it was during the time period when we weren't necessarily very well supervised, which is great uh, because we we played these war games out by, big, by this lake. So we went... Up to this place in the mountains oh, for, for spring. Go, I... We had two different places that we went to the uh, to, to choir camp for. First, we went in the spring to this place up near Big Bear. It had its own little lake, and they filmed something there one time. I can't remember what it is. It had like a a weird little dam, um, kind of like uh, one of those water wheel kind of things. Uh, oh, yeah. On one side of the lake, 
that where the lake kind of went down to this and then it had like a water wheel there and we went down on the river down there but um you know that place it was very it had i think it was a catholic retreat or something in its basic purpose but they rented it out to groups and stuff it had like dorms and uh mm. We didn't have beds, though, I remember. We had sleeping bags, and we just slept on the floor. Everybody, all the boys did in that place. There were beds at the, the place for summer camp. Anyway, um, we were all running around outside, and there were these big boulders and stuff. We played war, which is basically a game where we throw rocks at each other. So, you know, people were always getting hurt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're always getting hurt. I love Gen X stories. Uh, You're I, so funny. They had to take me to the hospital up there in Big Bear <laughs> when I got hit. Um, Hello, beauty. Right? Yes, you. Here somewhere. Can you patch it one like, right, up, right somewhere in here. Ooh. The thing is, it was kind of like a deep kind of thing. But the reason they had to take me to the, the doctor is. If you get yeah. cuts right around like here, it bleed like hell. It's just like it's yeah, they, bleeding. They don't they don't really clot up oh. really well. So it just kept I had blood going on down my face and the was like, Mr. Barry! We all had to like run back up to the thing and, and I was like, I got blood all over my face. <laughs> and <they were> like, <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> But there was there were rock there was one particular rock that was uh, important because a, a long succession of boys had bled on this rock. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anytime anyone was bleeding, you're supposed to go rub the blood on this rock. <laughs> so you got to do that. Oh yeah, my I had my blood on that rock at least a couple of times. <laughs> there was one boy who had nosebleeds who kept getting his, who kept, every time he got nosebleed, he put his blood on the rock. <laughs> That's so funny. You know, that made it more of like a war rock. Yeah. It was a boulder, but it was a boulder that it was easy to stand on top of. It was kind of flat on top, you know. Oh, my God, I love it. There was a lot of these boulders. Some of them were more flat than others. It was a lot of fun as a boy, you know. I can so see it as being really fun. It was super fun, running around these boulders and chasing each other and throwing shit at each other. It was fun. I don't, yeah. I, I don't remember particularly loving loving the practicing part, but... <laughs> You know, we had practice like three times a day. <laughs> it was kind of structured. The Pesky Boys Choir was kind of structured after like English, English shit, like British or whatever. Like I think there was, we had Vespers or something. What's a from, Vesper? It's some like evening prayer time. Oh, yeah. That, Retreats do that. But we, we weren't required to participate in it. I, but they, they always they had. Take your money though. Vespers. I didn't participate. Yeah, so, uh, they would have it in like a. I could totally. I went to on a retreat to one of those places for my confirmation. <laughs> so funny. I was picturing you guys like running around. It's a good way of spending your time. Well, and as I've said before, um, I guess my parents. It was a pretty serious choir. I mean, Passing Boys Choir was it was in business for a long ass time. Um, I don't know if it was a nonprofit, I think it was probably non profit, uh, but um, it no longer is. But it was for a really long time. And uh, the thing is, um, Mr. Barron and Mr. Bamer ran the thing. But none of us knew at the time, my parents or me or whatever, none of us put any twos or twos together, right? Was that these two people were obviously a gay couple, right? Mr. Bear and Mr. Bammer. <laughs> um, and my dad, when later on, like after I was out of the choir, as when I was an adult, he's like, he's like, uh, hey, did, uh, those guys who run the boys' choir ever touch you or mess with you or anything? <laughs> no, <laughs> they were <weren't really laughs> <laughs> just like you know, the silent generation coming to terms with homosexuality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it, it's uh, they just 
You know, I they, admire they, they, his. I, I really liked both those choir coaches, choir teachers, and they were both very uh, stern and took no shit. You know, it's like it wasn't like they were friendly and touched the boys or anything. All the boys were scared of them, and none of the boys uh, found them warm at all. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't warm. So they were assholes who were always yelling at us oh for not singing well enough. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I liked them. I respected them. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, they, they. It's like if you can imagine, you're trying to put on sort of concert level choir stuff for people's various occasions because you know we we were a working choir. We did funerals and weddings and stuff like that, and uh, um. That's cool. And so they're that trying to get these boys to to be ready to sing, right? And then, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Then, uh, um, of course, we're screwing around or whatever, being boys. And so, and, and I remember one time I was doing a solo in the back of the church, and Mr. Bam was like, "That was flat," you know. <laughs> <laughs> the the look of rage on his face oh as I was soloing from the back of the church. And he's having to put his thumb up like, you are flat, you motherfucker. <laughs> he was going to chop my head off. <laughs> that is so funny. Oh, my God. I would have been terrified. <clears throat> so, uh, anyway. Yeah, I have a lot of good memories about that choir. Of course, I got, you know, I got some shit for it from my friends. Uh, from my friends, like. Not not really like teased or bullied about it, but just sort of an inevitable kind of boy shit. Like, yeah, I remember Dave Porter saying, "Oh, do you have to go to quite quite practice?" <laughs> I was like, "Shut the fuck up! We're going to choir practice." Yes, yes. okay. <laughs> it's not called quite quite. Quite quite. <laughs> well, I mean, the choir directors did tell us some great <laughs> ghost stories. Like, there were two different variety of uh, of boogeymen of sorts. That one of which lived at the at the mountain camp, and one of which lived at the summer camp. I don't remember what the mountain camp one was called, but the one in the summer camp were called the Wooers. And the wooers were these creatures that lived in the tall grass that was around this. It was again a monastery, you know. It was, a, it was like a, yeah. a Catholic thing that they rented out, but they it was in Northern out. California. Yeah. And uh, he'd come and tell scary stories about the wooers, and then oh they go gosh. and and like the prefects, or who were like basically ex choir boys who were like sixteen or seventeen, or the directors themselves. I don't know. Would would when we after bedtime we'd go outside and you hear something <gasps> go woo 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 it's just great and then I heard them I heard the wooers last <laughs> night it's real I'm serious I heard it <laughs> probably the prefects or whatever <laughs> well, those are fond, fond memories from my childhood I have a very unfond memory of coming back from from wow. summer choir camp on the train. So we took the train up there every year uh, with Pink Eye. That oh, was no. Yeah. Yeah, Pink Eye. Wow. The story That's of the days of yore. That must have been so uncomfortable, though. It was a it was a miserable enough train ride that I remember it. I don't uh, remember any of the other train rides uh, back and forth to Quarter Camp. That says something. But I remember that one. <sighs> Wooers, yeah. Yeah, the thing is, uh, it, it did play it did play a part in that. I I am very grateful to them for having that boys choir. I'm grateful to my third grade teacher for recommending that I try out for it because mm -hmm. it was back in the day when I don't know how they went 
went about doing it, but they managed to get like an announcement in the Arcadia Public School third grade. Um, we are holding, we are holding tryouts for Pasadena Voice Choir, and I, I guess, was always singing in class and stuff or at recess. And the teacher specifically said, I remember singled me out and said, Eric, you should, you should try out for this. Aww. And so I did. And that's a magic moment. Yeah. It's nice. It is. I was, I just always, I guess, uh, sang a lot. I want to, uh, say what Nas, Nas mode. Uh, says about ISPs, how they come across as just very shy or very arrogant, strange. I have to agree with that. It's either very shy because I think Chloe comes off as shy, um, but not arrogant. But in reality, they're neither shy nor arrogant. Yeah. You know, they are, uh, they just don't have anything to say. What it boils down to, yeah. why say pointless words? There, nobody asked any questions, so why would I have any answers? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and if you do ask a question, my answer is very straightforward. Why do you think chickens cross the road to get to the other side? It was just a regular ISTP answer at first before it became a joke. <laughs> you know it. Rev ride reason. Strange, shy, arrogant, all the phases of my ISP life. But what I want to get back to, re, re mention, is that ISTPs are also the most, the, the smartest type that's not perceived as smart by a large margin. Yes. And the reason they're not perceived as particularly smart is because of the lack of expert intuition. In other words, they don't engage in a lot of pointless smarty pants talk. But if you try to teach a sixth grade, sixth grade ISTP girl, conditional logic, just pick that shit up like that. I couldn't believe it. Magic. I, I've taught much older students in that conditional logic before, and they don't pick it up that fast usually. Um, you know, NTPs might, STPs might, that's about it. I picked it up fast. INFJs can get there, but it takes a little while. On our own time. That's how it's selfish. It's like, all right, I know I can do this, but I need my pen, pencil. I mean, look, if, if I had a logic class and I had a regular display of students in that logic class and there was an INFJ in the class, the INFJ would have no problem with the pace of the class. Yeah. Because um, there'd be a lot of people who are a lot slower than the INFJ at picking it up. The speed at which I will go with Chloe is what happens when you work one on one, TI Dom and TI Tool. It's real, it's really something. She's so humble, too. She really is humble. I I don't think she's humble towards her. I can see her kind of being like fighting with her mom when her mom wants her to work with you, but she wants to go play with her friends. Like, I don't see her being, like, I can see her being kind of, like, that a little bit, like, with her mom. Like, no, mom, I want to play with my friends. I, I have an unusual relationship with ISTPs because I'm the supervisor type. So, it's like, ISTPs are not deferential at all by nature. In other words, they don't, they don't. They're not. They're not the type that's gonna defer to somebody else's judgment. Ah, know? so that's how it occurs. They're they're ISTPs with every type except ENTPs are like I. I'm the most qualified to do all the parsing here because I'm not including any extraneous stuff like extroverted intuition. And I'm factoring it in, or I'm applying what my deliberation does with a concrete, you know, realized action function. So that's what makes me so serious and confident in my own conclusions. The only type that they're not that way with, really, which which come across as either arrogant or as 
intimidating depending on who you're who you are dealing with an ISTP, but they don't they don't interact that way with ENTPs is the only ones. Uh, because they were a supervisor, you know. They also try to act very ESTP-ish. I mean, I I don't know if that's the case. I just think that, you know, it's like their tool function is SE. So um, there's Kimberly's kid, uh, Colin. He is an ISTP. And, um, you know, like one one night when, when I was living in LeVar, he... He came over and we heard the story the night before where his drunk friend had gotten himself into a bit of a pickle with some some dudes who were like actual tough guys and you know got was had gotten hit already, was about to get wailed on, and uh of course, Colin just stepped up and he's a skinny guy like me, really. But he stepped up and cold cocked the guy and fucking knocked him, knocked him clean out. Broke his hand in the process. Wow. But got That's his silly. friend out of there and all of his group out of there and and got him into their car that way before anybody got in any trouble. Wow. <laughs> I was wow. Like, That's what I was like. I was like, wow. <laughs> That's That's some... ISTP hero shit there, Colin. Yep. Nice going. You know? Yeah. So uh they they do have their their time and place, obviously. Yeah, know? for S and um a dude I know like a dude who really wanted to be ESTP, but like like I was always like, okay, yeah, whatever, but you're ISTP. We've been waiting for you, Genexio. Here's our token. <laughs> yes. Here's our token ISTP. He's here. He's ISTP, and he's deadly, deadly serious. We were discussing earlier, Genexio, percentage of statements and or comments that come out of your mouth that qualify as jokes. And we, we concluded approximately 1%. Approximately I mean, 1%. Okay, I'm going to go controversial here. Mm. Sasha Gray, totally ISTP. Can you see her being funny? No. <laughs> she takes it up the butt. Um, I'm sure she does take it up the butt, but I believe she's known as the blowjob queen. I don't know. Now... That's a it's a good girlfriend test of your boyfriend to mention that, and if he knows who she is, then <laughs> then you wag your finger at him. I do happen to know who she is. Okay, but that's what I mean. Genexial is not a an ISFP. It was a great joke to play on the unsuspecting. <laughs> I'm oh, pretty yeah. sure it's not. No, but she's very like she's like very serious. Like she, like I'm always like. You look like you want to beat someone up. She actually, she is, not to continue this conversation about her, but she is the one who, there was the controversy about, uh, she asked someone to punch her. So I think ISTPs can definitely be called serious. Well, of course, the other thing, the only reason particularly that the name sticks in my mind anyway is because one evening... I was on Facebook. This was way back in the day when um, when it when I had a the raw channel and it was on go to meetings still. Uh, it was it was in the initial incarnation of the uh, auto auto up record auto upload raw channel, and I was in the room and everybody else left. And it was other than that room. And then I started doing other stuff on the computer. I was on Facebook, and I saw a picture, a post of Sasha Gray, and it said, like, you know, ex-porn actress turns mainstream or yeah, something like went, that, you know? Yeah, she went mainstream. Um, and so, of course, <laughs> I was I like, her too. I was like, who is this chick, you know? Yeah, and you got to look it. up. And then 
And then, um, you know, before I know it, of course, I'm, I've got some porn open. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then I realized I had never left the, the recorded room. I was still, oh you know, my God. You know, the camera was still on me, but it was like from here up, right? You could see from here <laughs> thank up. God, thank God. So you couldn't see what I was doing. Oh my God. But you could hear in the background, <laughs> oh um, you know, Sasha Gray going, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and, uh, and me going, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then I, I finish and I, I close that, that incognito browser window or whatever. And then, um, <laughs> I go back to the other window that I was in and I realize I'm still in the bar room. I go in there and Janelle's in there going like, Oh my God, what's he doing? Typing into the chat. <laughs> I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God is right. So I went to the bar channel and immediately <laughs> deleted that video. Oh. <laughs> oh, I looked for it. No, I deleted that one. <laughs> I deleted that one. So, uh, <laughs> oh God. That's funny. You know, it's funny. Prior to that occurring, I had always said to myself, Eric, you better be careful or that's going to happen God. one day. And then I, it, even though I said that to myself, it still happened one day. Can I, can I tell my story? Sure. So I worked porn and in college. You worked porn? No. Is that what you said? No, I watched. I oh, watched, watched porn. Oh, oh my god! No, we've had this discussion okay, before. Well, that's what it sounds like you said. No, okay. I'm sorry. I was <laughs> marbling my words. I was. I watched porn, and um, one of uh, I guess I was on a site, and um, I get a knock on the door, and it's my roommate's boyfriend, and he's like, "Hey, like, can I?" It sounds like a penthouse forum letter in the making. Well, he goes and he's like, can I download some music on your your computer? I'm like, yes. Inside my head, I'm like, Rachel, what are you doing? You just clicked out of porn. Like, you don't know if it's still up there. Sure enough, like, I guess I didn't click off of it properly. But he goes through, like, all the things I was watching. He's like, oh, my God. He's like, Rachel, like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, every, he's like, Amanda, you got to come in here. He's like, look what Rachel's been watching. And I'm like, no. And of course, like, That's I'm like, you got to use incognito. Browser, <laughs> Rachel. This was, this was like in 2006. Uh, I didn't know about that. Like, and, but so like, he like told the whole world. He told the whole world, like all, all the people that I knew socially knew that I looked at porn and I really did not want them knowing that. So embarrassing. And if, if you had been a dude, nobody would have been surprised at all. Exactly. Um, ISTP, you're all fucked. I'll be waiting in my bunker for a new civilization. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, not the whole I world. Mean, it wasn't the whole world. The thing okay. is, ISTPs typically have both a motocross motorcycle and a regular motorcycle. Yeah. If, if they're successful enough, they also have a jet ski yep. and a boat. Yep. A work car and a regular car. Oh, they got their work truck, and then they've got mm -hmm. like maybe a uh, if they're successful enough, like a like a souped-up Acura or something. <laughs> <laughs> like you know, ISCPs are the kind who their FE is not good enough to realize that's not actually a cool car. Yeah, and they're just focused on the specs, and they go, "Oh, well, this has better specs, so I'm getting the Acura." And they go, yeah, but it's an Acura. And they go, I don't understand. My fourth slot if he really doesn't know. go there, bro. <laughs> you really know the ISTP. Fall on Hot says, my INTP roommate puts tape over his laptop camera 
and phone camera. He also thinks helicopters follow him. LOL. Is he a meth addict? <laughs> Sometimes I wave at helicopters because I'm like, I just want to say hey. Used to be? He's, st he's still crazy after quitting? Are you sure he's used to be? That sounds like meth addict stuff. That's the kind of shit that I never did when I was a meth addict. You know, that's the, for some reason, I ne it never, it never made me crazy like that. <laughs> it never made me, um, a lot of acid too. Well, it, it never made me paranoid like that. Uh, I, I always just thought, well, that's not a logical conclusion. You know, my, my friend who I was doing it with, he, he, he believed lots of crazy stuff. ICP crossword puzzles or nah? I would say yeah, nah. yeah. They do yeah. Like crossword puzzles. Who oh, no. knew? Oh wait, crossword puzzles? Yeah. No, regular puzzles like puzzle pieces. You love, love, and they love um, card games. Well, they like video games in general. Video a lot. games, yep, a lot. They like shooters. Mm-hmm. Um. And the genetics deal, I'm surprised that uh I like strategy games. Yep, strategy games. I kinda I was watching this anime, it kind of makes me want to play a game where I move troops around. Okay, let's you play. Know? Can I play with you? Well, we have to find one, you know. I, I have to look around I for a video my... game. I, I do have civilization, the new one, but that civilization is too complicated. I get it's too bogged down in details. Mm -hmm. uh, I want something that's more like simple or something. Um, Ethan, ISTP is the most represented type in the Olympics. That makes decent sense. I, you know, the thing is, I would suggest that ESTJs are the type that's most likely to be capable of doing whatever. Yeah. So it's like including being a fantastic debater or debate coach, even though it's not really in their wheelhouse. Yeah. Including whatever, because what they really know how to do is to optimize their own experience to be progressively working towards goals. Okay. You're right. They do do that. And they do that so well. They do it like it's nothing. My, my question is, how, how, I mean, do you just, because a lot of times because they can do so much, like my mom always used to say, if I can do it, you can do it like all the time. And, like, I'd be, like, you're not wrong, but, like, I'm definitely bad at some stuff. Like, don't, like. If you can, if I can do it, you can do it is not, is not true. <laughs> it's, it's it, like, that's what I mean. It's basically never true. It assumes that what's easy for you, it, like, you go to somebody, high thousand stars. You go to somebody and say, uh, look, I'm not very smart and I could figure this out. <laughs> So sure you can. Oh well, I mean, that assumes that the thing you figured out requires the same kind of smartness that you don't have very much of. Yeah. And I would be like, yo, like, I want to be a good daughter for you, but also I'm different from you. <laughs> so, like, the, like, these things that you do for yourself, like, sure, yeah. One thing she was always on me on, like, uh, my room. I'm a messy person. Like, uh, I don't. I keep things tidy at best. She was always like, oh, don't worry. I used to be really messy too. And then I became really neat. And I was like, mom, I think that's just you. I don't think that's going to be true for me. <laughs> right. Um, so Hi, Rain Pinky. says, how good can tertiary TI be as their theoretical limit? Oh, it's Pinky, not so much yes. good at it, right? One's approach to TI is different when one has it in third slot and second slot. So I've seen a lot of range of capacity in TI in third slot in terms of passing logic test questions. But it's it's mostly about how it plays out in terms of, of whether it's an absolute value or an instrumental value and whether or not it's, it's like for, for TI third slot, after a conversation is over, they go, that didn't really make that much sense. <laughs> Whatever that person was saying, right? But I, I, 
I did that TI parsing after the fact because the FE is a more is my tool function, so that's what I was attending to. Same thing with me and FE. After I have some sort of argument that runs runs into the ground with somebody like that, my initial debate with Jack or debate with one of those you know ENFPs that David Sanderson brought me to debate or whatever. At the end of it, and after I'm done yelling at everybody, um, I go, "Well, that was an FE disaster." Uh, but oh my you know, god, that could honestly have putting me on the spot with uh, third TI in the third. I mean, you see it in in my video with Eric interviewing me about what type I am. I mean, I. I know what I'm doing, but at the same time, it like felt like a joke. So I was like, you know, I had to have him, I, I was fumbling, um, but we've tested it. Um, it, it, depend, it depends on, on experience as well. So TI is, well, it's a, it's a solid check. The TI questions are a solid check of where someone's TI mm -hmm. is. What it really tells me is if it's one, two, or seven. Um, the other ones, as I said before, three, four, five, six, eight, is kind of a mishmash because it is influenced a lot by SI. So if you're yeah. if you're a third slot TI and you've taken a logic class in college, uh, you'll do a right. lot better on these questions than if you're third slot TI and you haven't. If you're second slot TI, even if you have no experience with logic, you'll interpret the questions as they're intended to be interpreted and typically get them right. Um, <laughs> the thing is, it's, it, it's not, see, when you say that tiny man six, six, it's like environments can compel a person to, focus more or less on their third slot function, especially, or fourth slot, potentially. Um, if I grew up in a household that was very not very much non-responsive to TI and very much responsive to FE, I probably would have been a more conflicted person in general, but also yeah. I would have probably develop better FE. I noticed that my daughter, Delilah, in general, has much better FE than I do or more more outcome-oriented FE. So uh, in that regard, she was trained by an ESFJ mother who was very fixated on appearances and making sure that her daughter made a good impression so that, you know, it's like for ESFJs, the daughter is mostly there to prove what a good mother they are and how wonderfully a good job they've done raising this child and how polite and wonderful she is so that the ESHA can feel good about themselves. Yes, and that's, <laughs> that's how I was as a friend. You know, even having uh, ESFJ as a friend, like going shopping with them, like it's like, oh, that like, you know, oh, that'll look cute on you. Yeah, you should get it. Like. FE, like affirming stuff on physical appearances, like was always like very important. And I learned, I definitely learned. I was definitely more of a tomboy before having friends with an ESFJ. Well, Rachel had a basic strategy when dealing with uh, female others who were <laughs> serving us. Uh, so anytime, uh, like a chick has something weird going on, say for example, super long fingernails, or um, like, you know, crazy colored makeup on, or uh, dyed hair or whatever, she'll find something positive to say about that thing. Presumably on the grounds that that individual is peacocking that thing because they want it noticed and yeah. will feel gratified by having it positively regarded. Mm -hmm. And this is something she, this is some girl thing like where <laughs> girls, oh, I love your top. Oh, I really like the color of your meow. I really 
do like to be that girl because I feel <laughs> like, and even she said it, like girl to girl, like compliments, like it's so nice. Like coming from a guy, sometimes you can be like, like, yeah, okay. You know, like you, you like my top. <laughs> well, see, I think that's why girls like gay guys so much. Yeah. Is because gay guys can, yeah. um, can compliment you on your looks and stuff and be a man while concurrently not, you can be comfortable that they're not trying to get in your pants. Yeah. They, I mean, according to the movies, they do like to still play with the boobies though. Can't get away from boobies. Everybody likes titties. Everybody looks, yeah, everybody likes titties. Um, like for example, um, Thank let's, you, Tony let's talk about this character in the show I was watching, this anime show. The character is a, he's a hairdresser, and what he does is when ladies come into his hair salon, he scolds them about not taking good enough care of their yeah. hair, and he tells them how a hair is a woman's most precious thing, and blah, 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 blah. And all the women want to pay him lots of money to cut their hair and have him scold them about about how much care they're giving their hair. Once he, As soon as he wakes up from his deep sleep, they... Once he becomes one of these uh, chrysalises, he goes into deep sleep. As soon as he wakes up from the deep sleep, the administrator lady who brings him out of the deep sleep, the first thing he says coming out of deep sleep is, you've been taking terrible care of your hair. Oh, my gosh. This, this is ridiculous. Look I, at this. It's so flat. No body, I, no sheen. I have to say, <laughs> he's probably ESFP as well. I don't know. I don't know. Gay guys don't hit on you and then try to fuck you? Is that true? That's that's a tricky trick, by Don't the way, guys. Hair is beauty on a woman. I mean, if you're into hair, I guess. <laughs> I always found the yeah. hair thing ridiculous. Like, I find all those women product things ridiculous. Different. It. What's the name of the anime? It's um, it's on Netflix. It's the one I was watching at 1.5 speed. It's called uh. Um, well, balls are not always salty in the Igma wave. You know, you should try tasting some after they have a shower. Yeah. It's called, I'll tell you right now what it's called. I don't know if girls are always like, oh, scold me some more. <laughs> <laughs> it's called... I think it's this one, yeah. What is this called? The The what? Oh, oh Sword, Sword Guy. guy. <laughs> All right. Sword Guy the animation. G A I. Um and uh I I I find it amusing to think of I bet that would work, you know. If you were a hairdresser and you wanted to be like the, the fanciest hairdresser in Beverly Hills or whatever, the, a good strategy would be as soon as a woman comes in, you go, okay, sit. Let me find the inner beauty within you. Let me find the, the beautiful, the beautiful hair that you have lost. Let me find <laughs> it for you. Have you been have you been rubbing eggs into your hair every morning like I told you? <laughs> How do you expect to live as a truly realized woman with flat, bodiless, sheenless hair like this? And I go, oh, here's five hundred dollars. Tragic. <laughs> Not related anymore. My dealers and I it's being just paid them a visit. Congratulations. We're they actually do. running out of weed. See, they are serious. They're serious. They tend to be dealers because they're serious about making money when they want to. Yeah. <gasps> Yay! He got heroin and it can wave. Chris got his pound of heroin that he was he was he had ordered earlier in the week. Can I give you a kiss? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's called smooching emotions. Smooching emotions. Yeah. Don't do so much heroin, Chris Chavin. It'll make you sleepy. 
then you'll have to you get a, a vicious cycle taking uppers to stay awake and then heroin to go to sleep oh man all right here we go we're gonna spark this joint this is a free joint that we got but it's totally premium all which right. just means um basically it won't make us throw up maybe it's like well, the, the pre rolls that you get from the stars are pretty. Yeah. There's nothing to write home about, usually. Mm, usually. Unless you want to write home about what a. Uh, do I replay links, links to the Past or Link's Awakening? Are you looking for the episode with oh. the hairdresser in it? <laughs> um, it? It's not. It's not that, yeah. The thing is, <coughs> I don't remember which episode it is. It was a while back. I'm in season two right now. But it's, I would say it's more than just shy of being bench worthy. I would say it's fairly mediocre compared to a lot of other animes that I watch that are fantastic. It's good. You know what's fun too is when you find a good one on Netflix, you could usually get more of it on Crunchyroll. Mm. Well, that's proven to be the case with Durarara. Yeah. So, um, Rachel and I both really enjoyed Durarara. I think it's fair to say that it's probably one of Rachel's favorites. Hell, um, oh, hell. Is that Gaff? No, I think it's great. I think it's a really great one. I, I think it's a particularly I like, INFJ show, Durarara. I like. Um, Dorohidoro probably just as much too. I was thinking about Dorohidoro. Dorohidoro is good. Morning, yeah. But um, you know, Death Note was good up until um, L died. And then it got kind of just. I know. I, I agree with you. I had trouble. I had trouble with the Death Note. <coughs> Look, there are a lot of better animes out there than Death Note. Death Note is one of the most overrated animes, I think. Um, one of the, the highest rated, but not at all overrated animes, of course, is Attack on Titan. I like World Trigger, World too. Trigger's fantastic. Yeah. Um, Fire, um, Fire Force is fantastic. Yeah, Fire Force. Like, I wrote a review on Crunchyroll this morning Fire Force because I noticed that it only had four stars. And I was like, hey, who are these fucking morons who are giving it less than five stars? Yeah. It's, it's one of the best it ones. It is. Um, I really like... Uh, I like Black Clover too. I like Black Clover. We're just coming to an end in March. Oh wow! <coughs> Fire Force, tell them what the, what it's about, Eric. So Fire Force is about um, there are these people who uh, spontaneously combust. And when they do, they, they become these creatures called Infernals who are on fire. And um, the fire force is the fire department that puts out the Infernals, whereas the regular fire department puts out the ensuing fires. Because the Infernals are hard to put out, right? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think you have that backwards, Rain. I really think you have that backwards. I think Attack on Titan author INTP, Death Note author INTJ, or at least the work of art, Attack on Titan, I mean, Attack on Titan in some sense transcends type. It's so genius, but uh, Death Note is much more N-I-T-E and uh, Attack on Titan is much more N-E-T-I. So I, I don't know if if that's correct about the authors, but that's that's my assessment that it works. I wanted to <coughs> answer uh, Rain's question <coughs> about INFJ and FE. Um, Frank J James compares it to like when you have a battery and it's full, and FE is full for a while. And the more FB you use, the less, like, you can handle it. So, like, the more socialization I do and the less time I have to myself, the more FB it takes I'm using because I'm using it as a tool. So, 
my FE goes down the more I use it. So it gets to a point where my FE is just like, it, I could be totally rude without meaning to be, but like, I'm like, it, I get to a point where I'm like, I, I'm sorry, like, I just want to go in and out of this place. I don't really feel like, like, being like, blah, 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 blah. Not so good at trolling. Thank you. Uh, this is the OG shirt for the channel. Mm -hmm. There's been a couple of other runs of shirts. There's a green one with yellow words I'll, on it. I'll wear it. All right. Okay, cool. There's a, a baseball shirt that's white with red sleeves. Um, that one's a classic, too. I like that one also. I think I stole that one. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, I disagree with you, Rain. I think the inclusion of all those explanations is very INTP. I'm off camera, right? Yeah, you're off camera. Um, whether or not an INTJ would have those explanations in mind is one question. Whether or not they feel the need to include them is another. The fact that, that AOT has huge pages of text that you have to pause to read suggests to me very strongly that that's not an INTJ piece of work. That's an INTP maneuver. Look, I got to get all this information in because I'm an INTP, so I got to get it all in. But um, I know that I can't, make, I can't make a good piece of anime while having this huge piece of text here. So I'll just compel everybody who's watching it to pause if they want to read it. Really sure. INTPs can be very silly. I've yes. been known to be extremely silly. Definitely. I think ANTPs can be silly indeed. What I what I think is interesting is the poll question I asked today, which was here's me playing the world's smallest violin, snorted the blank dismissively. Uh ENTJ uh won by a large margin. There was winning by a large margin. But ENTP actually got like 25% of the votes or something. Mm -hmm. So I expected, uh, I didn't expect the ENTP to get very many votes because <laughs> I don't think I'm very much like that. <coughs> I guess I can be. It really depends on my mood. I can be nothing but silly, depending on my mood. If you've ever watched me telling one of my bedtime stories, when I'm not engaging with the chat at all, and I'm not responding to anybody, but just I'm making shit up as I'm going to sleep, uh, I can be very silly. I make myself laugh a lot, you know? He makes um, me laugh a lot, too. You know, the other... The other day, I don't remember how long ago it was, maybe a week or two ago. Oh no, I woke up screaming, that's right. <laughs> I didn't wake up laughing. Eric sucks, come at me. No, I don't. No, I don't suck. Uh, yeah, you suck. No, I don't. You suck. Who's an yeah. INFJ in Hunter versus Hunter? Uh, I don't know. I don't think there is one. Uh, I'd say who's an INFJ is... Uh, you ever watched um, Q? In Q, uh the the setter that's that's not very athletic but is successful anyway. He's an INFJ. Um, Yamato in Naruto Shippuden. Yamato, yeah, yeah, Yamato from Naruto Shippuden for sure. Um, Armin from AOT, Armin. I forget which one is Armin. Armin. He's the blonde kid with the blue eyes. Oh, the blonde kid with the blue eyes? Yeah, I think, I don't see him as I don't INFJ. see him as INTJ. Or INTJ. Oh, INFJ. Oh, he might be, I see him more as ISFJ, probably. Yeah, I don't think he's an INFJ. Um. I don't think there's an INFJ in... Uh, AOT. Yeah, I don't. I don't resonate really with like any. 
Yeah, they're not that common. Neither are ENTPs in anime. But mm -hmm. I can we can I can find some of them. Like uh oh, thank you. Like um hmm. Hmm. And, uh, the, oh. I mean Durara Durara. I'll tell you who's an INFJ, who's a great male INFJ character is uh the main character in Gate. Remember how you asked me if I wanted to re re watch that? Oh yeah. Uh now I do kind of know that it occurs to me that the main character in Gate is a male INFJ. In the anime Gate. If you've never seen the anime Gate, it's actually one of my favorites. Uh all right let's can we rewatch it? Sure. It's about it's basically a some um some Japanese anime, ma manga maker, or whatever, basically he said, I want to imagine a world in which uh, the, the Japanese military <coughs> once again <coughs> engages in <coughs> basically conquest, but in a super nice guy way. <laughs> now keep in mind, when they take this gate into this new world, the first thing the Japanese military does is get attacked by the combined armies of these kingdoms there and and mows down with machine gun fire a hundred thousand people. No, I don't. That's not true, actually. I don't find cartoon porn um, arousing, really. I, I prefer uh, live action porn. I have a question. Yes. I know every time, like, it's like almost every time Delilah's here, I have something, like, for her. But, like, I got this for myself, and it's too big on my ankle. I want to see if it would fit on her. Okay, cool. You know, Delilah and, and Rachel have a fantastic relationship. And also, uh, um, Delilah, I mean, Rachel and the cat have a fantastic relationship. Yes, we really do. No, ISTPs are not. Not even close. They're goofs. Well, maybe inside their hearts, Stan, but outside their hearts, not so much. Which type is the most Debbie Downer? Probably mm, I don't ISTJ. Be on, I don't want to be honest about this. What do you think? I always think ESTJ. ESTJ is the most Debbie Downer? Kind of. Well, kind of. Like, my, like, for example, my dad and I have had multiple occasions where we've had this conversation in front of Rachel, so she's seen it where uh, I go, but dad, that's not going to happen. And he's like, well, that's where you know how you and I disagree. You're, you're an optimist. You're an optimist. Yeah, he loves you. You're an optimist. <sighs> you know, they plan for... Uh, and and I ESTJ is happy when they think they've got every possible way that things yes. can go wrong planned. Yes, for them. they plan. What what's that that phrase? Expect the plan, plan for the worst. plan for the worst. Expect the best. No, like, expect the worst. No, plan for the worst. Expect the worst. I don't know. So you know what ESTJs I'm talking about, are, though, right? They are both ex expect the worst and plan for the worst, and continue to expect and plan for the worst indefinitely. <laughs> yes. And they usually are like amazing at it. Like they make it easy for their families to have to deal with all of those things when it comes to their frame. Genexio got it right. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. That's it. My mom always used to say that's the best way to live. And I would be like, Mom. Another ESTJs have a fair number of sayings, you know. Um Son, you need the right tool for the right job. This is an ESTJ thing. Or, uh, you know, my dad was always fond of saying, don't use the bigger hammer theory. Uh, in other words, that that's what TE frustration is, is the bigger hammer theory. Oh, this thing is frustrating me. Hit, 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 hit. <laughs> you know? <laughs> They're guardian supervisors. I mean, that's how 
there to me. That yeah, that literally would be. They're good arc builders, right? Right. Yeah. It's like I I remember my experience with my parents as far as homework went. Uh, I'd say to my mom, "Hey, can you quiz me?" And then she proceed. I proceed to learn it by her quizzing me. I go to my dad and say, "Hey, can you quiz me?" And I get one wrong. He's like, "You're not ready for this." Oh my god! The only reason it's funny is because it's true. I could totally picture it. <laughs> You're not ready to be quizzed. Oh my god! <laughs> You're not ready for this. <laughs> You need to go study this some more. <laughs> Dad, I'm trying to avoid studying. That's, what, that's, yeah. how, that's why I'm doing this. Yeah, but, but they the, don't get that. The quizzing thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not impressed. <laughs> I mean, that is, yeah. I've said this many times before, too. No matter what else happens, I cannot, I can, I will never shake the, the clear sense that my dad, I wouldn't say he doesn't respect me, but I would say that, that that's the best way of putting it, is that he is thoroughly unimpressed. Nothing, nothing I do or say impresses him. Um, and, and the thing is that, same here, right? Like, I'm not a partner who right, impresses he, him. He, he gave Rachel a little bit of the ESTJ the other day I because... She's supposed to tell him <laughs> that I have, I need dental work. I'm sorry, but that's not my style. Well, the thing is, he's used to me having, you know, SFJ wife, which I had for a long time. And then SFJ girlfriend, which I had for a while. And then uh, he's never encountered NFJ significant other yeah it's a whole different ball game it is it really i mean i would expect it to be he expects and wants rachel to to go in and be a bit of a a bossy busy body you know and of course that's not she's not comfortable with that role at all i'm not really she's an infj it, it you know it um comes out more and more like the bagels i felt like that was like a like a Good job. I patted myself on the back for that because I get nervous. I, I mean, I love your dad, but he still does intimidate me. He's so smart. And like, sometimes we miscommunicate and well, I don't mean to. The other thing is he definitely has resting bitch face. Yeah. And it's impossible to read him. So. Yeah. Sometimes. He'll come up to you. He'll, he'll be like, um, son. We have something serious to talk about here. Really, really serious. Like, fuck, what is it? You know, uh, we we've got to come to a conclusion about where we're going to go to the desert in June. What? That's the serious thing you're talking about. <laughs> I was expecting to hear some horrible news. And you're just saying, ah. Uh, you haven't gotten back to me yet about this thing I suggested that we could go for June. I'm like, oh, right, my bad. <laughs> and of course, you know, he's generally quite nice, but. Um, yes, he is. Don't make him wait. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, if I say, okay, I'll, I'll be ready to go at nine, and there's no hurry, so I'm rolling out of here at nine, 10, it's not okay. That's extremely rude, Eric. To make me wait like that. You know? <laughs> yeah. So. My mom was a stickler about time too. Goalkeeper made an unbelievable save. ESEA, that's his job. Well, the thing is, ESEA sports announcers are terrible. Look at Bill Walton as an example. The ESTJ, you know, the 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 play-by-play -play guy goes, Goal goalkeeper makes an unbelievable save. The ESTJ color guy goes, that reminds me of the time I made an unbelievable save back in 1947 what? playing for the Mamma 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 Mamma. Yeah, like, no people cares. back then were a lot different than they are now. It's like, okay, yes. <laughs> what? 
want to hear about the players now. <laughs> like, not that we're not impressed by your, your attainments, but. Have I mentioned I'm Bill Walton? <laughs> Bill Walton is such an ESTJ. He has terrible FE. I mean, it's like he doesn't care at all, even if the his co-announcer is saying to him, Bill, can you please talk about the game? That's He just ignores <laughs> it and just get, plows right ahead with his story about Bill Walton from 1974. <laughs> it, it, that's also the case, Seamus. That's also the case. I love you, Dad. Okay, all right. All right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that, that's enough. It's <laughs> <laughs> so funny. And then sometimes he's like, he wants to know like what you're up to, and sometimes he totally does not care at all. Right. So you can't you can't generalize any rules from no. anything. So it's like, uh, I go on one day, and I suggest to watch sports game, and he gets mad at me because he's in the middle of something. And maybe the next day he might come out here and get mad at me for not suggesting watching a sports game. <laughs> yeah. Like, no. It's you, you never know. Yeah, yeah, you just, you just no, never know. It's a crapshoot. It really is. Like, I really did pat myself on the back for, like, going in there to make the bagels. And then I was going to go in today again um, and make the bagels, but he was napping. And I don't want to mess with that. Like, you know, I don't like waking people up in general. So we just microwave them. <laughs> Oh yeah, my dad would just be like, you know, oh, "Okay, all he, right." He, he <laughs> looks. He looks up for a minute. Okay, yeah. But, you know, he'll say, "He'll say, oh, I love you too." Okay. Right. <laughs> you know, he's he's, he a, he's, a, he's loving. He's a very uh, healthy ESTJ. Yeah, he is. Um. Hi, pee pee. He's also super. Have you been adventuring? Uh, Enigma Wave, absolutely. ESTJ, when there's a gopher, get the BB gun. We don't have gophers here in Southern California that I know of, anyway. But we do have squirrels that eat our peaches, and my dad shoots at them with a pellet gun. <laughs> and if the mockingbirds get too loud for his, well, not anymore because he's deaf, but it used to be when I was younger, he found the mockingbirds too loud and he shoot at them, even though the peacocks are way louder. But the mockingbirds are more consistent in their loudness, I guess. You know, if there's weeds in the in the driveway, get out some poison, kill the weeds. <laughs> it's like you know, ESCJ is the one who came up with like like mustard gas. <laughs> well, well, we're trying to kill a lot of people, aren't we? That seems effective. <laughs> Got a wide wide range of effects. You know, it melts all their skin and everything. <laughs> it is effective. So, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, I don't understand your, oh, horrific? Well, I mean, you know, we are killing people after all. <laughs> I survived it. Now, you know an ESCJ came up with Agent Orange. Our troops are being killed in the jungles of Vietnam. Uh, herbicide the whole country? <laughs> How about we herbicide the whole country? That should do the. That should fix the problem. <laughs> Just drop herbicide on the entire country of Vietnam, oh and then we'll have nice open fields to fight in. <laughs> Won't that be great? Oh my god! You know it, my, right? My, my mom. My mom was always the one to try to put something of a stop to that because my dad was a big believer in. Whatever the problem is, a solution involves either poison or shooting it or, <laughs> or whatever. My mom, my mom would always say, stop spraying that stuff around, David. <laughs> yeah, she didn't like it at all. Uh, <laughs> you know, we had this beautiful maple tree in the backyard. Oh, that's such a bummer. They ended up getting killed in the remodel. Uh, but, you know, it's like my dad only always saw it as, Leaves he has to clean up every week. 
It's just a mess, son. It's just it, I see. I'll tell you what I see that thing as is a mess. <laughs> A beautiful maple tree, which probably like has so many different colors on it. Mm -hmm. It was lovely, but uh, they tried to build the deck around it and cut into the roots of it too much and killed it. <sighs> so anyway, my dad didn't care. He's like, "Well, you were leaves clean up." My mom was heartbroken. I was heartbroken too. Uh. Less, less so than my mom. My ISFJ mom was heartbroken. Oh. Does my dad speak like a 1920s gentleman? No. He talks like I like I, I imitate him. Yeah. He's quite gruff. He's, He's gruff. He's Mc, gruff. McGruff the dad dog. Yeah. <laughs> He's gruff but loving in his own way. He you really know, is. Incredibly loving in his own way. Yeah. Yes, he very he, much is. Like he gives you no sign of that. Really. Yeah, like <laughs> he uh, got back from his trip from visiting his friend Richard, and he came back with a puzzle of New York for us. And I was like, "Oh, that's so nice!" And so, like, it's just like, like so, so of nice. Rachel and I don't get puzzles <laughs> because you know jigsaw puzzle is such an site thing. Um. Work hard, go to sleep. Later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they they just it's like everything's always framed through either a goal or a, a problem, and uh, it's hard for them to to deal with life when it's not presenting them with either goals to attain or problems to solve. So it's like when you sit them down for dinner. And you let them talk. They, that's when you see, like, I guess the stuff that's interesting to them, all the stuff they've retained, all the information they've gathered over their life. And my dad knows so much about so much stuff. Mm -hmm. Every any war, or any political matter, or whatever, he'll give you a really. A really correct, informed position about. Yeah, it. he's he's not agenda driven. He's not partisan. He's self interest driven. He openly states that nowadays he votes in his own economic interest. Uh, he used to vote more from sort of a philosophical perspective mm. of what ought to be, but uh, he says, "Well, these days I just vote in my economic interest," you know. Uh, which basically means, I guess, he votes for Republicans. I don't know. He also has a position where he doesn't think it's appropriate to tell tell you necessarily who he voted for. You ask him. I almost like the two. He'll say, it's an anonymous ballot for a reason. <laughs> you know, like yeah, a secret, like, secret ballot for a reason. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> my brother would quiz my mom all the time and she would never give it up. The other thing my dad has done is he's put together all these photo albums of all these trips and experiences that the family had and he never looks at them. Really? Yeah, he never looks at them. <laughs> he puts them they together. They take so much time. He writes underneath the pictures like where you were, what was going on. Yeah. Sometimes you can read it, sometimes you can't. He's got terrible handwriting. <laughs> but uh, That's one thing that we have in common, your dad and I, the way that we write numbers. Well, the other thing is, this is this is eight slot FE. Um, uh, I I know this is boring, and I'm sorry to keep going on and on. Anyway, to continue. <laughs> yes, I know you've heard <laughs> this before, but right, it, it's like it's it's like the uh, back in Temple City, there was this particular variety of driver. It was a 30-something-year-old Chinese woman who drove with white gloves and a welding mask before COVID, you know? Wow. Um, and these women uh, who 
were probably fairly newly arrived to America or something. I don't know. They would consistently, there's a street in Temple City called, not Garibaldi, but the one above it. I guess it's, I guess it's long then. And the stop signs going this way, but there's no stop signs going this way. All of these women keep going. They come to a complete stop and then they proceed without ever looking either way or thinking about whether the other direction has a stop sign, right? Mm -hmm. It's like they're just going through the motions of treating a stop sign mm -hmm. as it's supposed to be treated rather than understanding what a stop sign is for, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like that's eight slot FE. You know, they'll go through the motions of FE without understanding what it's for. Yeah. Does anyone think Frank Sinatra was innovative as a vocalist? That never came to my mind when I thought of him. That's not a word I'd use for him. Um, you know who I think is the most inclusive tonally as a vocalist from that period, certainly? Is Dean Martin. I was just going to say that. When you listen to Dean Martin, you feel like you're invited to his party. You know? Don't you want to be invited to his party? Well, you feel like you want to be, and you yeah. are. It's like you're part of this. Whereas Frank Sinatra is more uh, like uh, showing you what, you know, you're out on the outside looking in at what cool sounds like or whatever. I have a question. Mm -hmm. They type Frank uh, Sinatra as ESTJ a lot. Do you agree with that? I think he's ESTP. Mm. Um. Or ESFP, but probably ESTP. No, almost certainly ESTP. ESTP, my um, way, yeah. And you think about it, if you think about his weird relationship with that one chick that he was like super in love with and uh, didn't really ever get over, and then, but she didn't really, she moved on from him. It sounds like maybe that that one chick was an NFJ of some sort. Uh -huh. Um, but it, like kick in the head, ain't that a kick in the head? Is um is such a uh, is such a cinematic song. It is. It, you've seen it in so many movies that it just kind of links to this this scene of explosions in a movie coming to a uh, like everything falling apart in front of the main character's eyes or whatever. Yeah. Like this part of the plan falling apart over here while these people are getting shot and his his friend is going Running and going, no, we've been tricked, you know, and then that song's playing in the background, the explosion's going off, and the main character's standing there going, oh, fuck. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, it's... But it's, but at the same time, like, you can see, like, his warmth, right? Like Right, well, that's the thing, but the thing is, that's what makes it, that's what makes it a perfect song to play over that thing, because it gives the audience distance, and while also including them in it, like yeah. it says... Um, despite despite everything falling apart, this is the mood, and and it's like there's no song that does that does uh like um, when when all your troops are defeated and and you know the barbarians are closing in, the best thing you can do is laugh, you know. It's like there's there's that kind of quality to it um, with Dean Martin. So you kind of feel like linked in archetypally with a, a uni universal human experience rather than, you know, it, it makes your, your individual suffering just an example of something that's happened a million times before, you know? Um... Fly me to the moon, I've got to get myself some cheese. I'll go up there and cut a big old slice of cheese. Oh, my, 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 my. In other words. Oh, those, those are different songs, right? That's what we were talking about the other day. Yeah, song, right? yeah. Those are different songs. Yeah. I think I think I just combined two different songs. I think I combined um, "Fly Me to the Moon" and "In Other Words," and, 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 unless that is the they same do song. Like mold and thick. They mush together. Well. Yeah. Um, 
Of course, Dean Martin played the role of the drunk for most of his career, but he actually was the least drunk of the whole group. Really? Yeah. And he also, he sort of played along with Frank Sinatra's uh, shtick. Like, Frank Sinatra would send prostitutes to his room, and he'd pay them money to just go back and tell Frank Sinatra that he rocked their world and they just mm. go to bed, you know? That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. It's like he didn't really want to be part of that whole uh, Rat Pack thing, mm -hmm. but he he understood that the role the role he played in it sort of and was willing to to fulfill that role as a, a career, but didn't really live it at all. Whereas Frank Sinatra actually lived that, mm -hmm. you know he he got drunk every night and gambled and. When I fancy dancers, dinners, and slept with lots of women, and you know, yeah, did all that stuff. He was that. He was really that guy. Yeah, he was that guy. Would you like um a bag of something, like you know, uh, chips? I would like a bag of a cup of coffee. Mm, okay. Is, is that acceptable? Can I ask you for that? Yes, you can. Thanks. It sounds exhausting. I agree. I would much rather be Dean Martin than Frank Sinatra. Uh, Dean Martin than Frank Sinatra? Yeah, yeah Frank Sinatra right. sounds exhausting. <laughs> sounds like, uh, you know, it's like, it's it's dangerous when the world affords you too much of an ability to just go on easy mode, you know, just live in your first two functions all the time. Um <laughs> I want to know, like, there's this rumor that he got a part in a movie because of his association with the Mafia. And it's shown in Godfather, in the, in the movie The Godfather. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know what scene I'm talking about? I, I, remem I remember the, the conversation with The Godfather about, about whether the person got in the movie or whatever. Yeah. But um, like they don't I don't know what him. movie you're talking about. Yeah, I know. I yeah. know. They don't. Yeah. It's not literally yeah. called Frank yeah. Sinatra. Yeah. But that's the story that like he was in like the hole in his career, and um, he went to the mafia to get it back. What was that movie we watched not that long ago where that where that driver keeps talking about Frank Sinatra to his passenger? <sighs> It's that little guy who plays. He has seen him in a lot of movies. He's a little guy. He's like a little Italian guy, and he now Frank. He he was with the guys. Oh in, my god! Not Joe Pesci. No, it's not I Joe don't Pesci. Even know what? I don't know. Do you know what I'm talking about? Though? Does it ring a bell? No. Oh, okay. Well, the, it's a movie where uh, whoever whoever's being okay. driven around. Is being driven around by a guy who keeps trying to talk about Frank Sinatra, who's who's reading a book about Frank Sinatra, and he's trying to talk about him to the How passenger. How do I not remember this? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Was it a rom com or? Or a funny one. Well, like while he's talking about Frank Sinatra, you go he's right in the back seat, rolls up like the limo window between the front and the back, and oh. you know, so like kind of like you prick or whatever. Um, I it, it I might be it might be the player by Walter by Robert Altman. It might be. Um, oh, who's the main character in that? Remember that guy? He's uh, Tim Robbins. Yeah, yeah. It might, it might be Tim Robbins right okay. in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that might be the movie, but I'm not sure. It's, it, I don't feel that sort of bing that would normally feel if I was a certain if I were actually that, right. But it might be that movie. <clears throat> okay, I think I'm gonna wrap it up. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here, Winston's mom. Check on your ferrets. Uh, I believe one of them is currently getting into trouble. 
of some sort. Chris Chapman, don't do all the heroin at once. Um, Swift Eagle, slow down. You're moving too fast. If you don't slow down, you're going to crash. You should watch what's been going on because you've been running all over town. Uh, Nos Dnodmidi, your name has too many consonants. Rain. That's not how you spell rain. Shame is the drunks. Your addiction to the caps lock is offensive. And that's about it. <coughs> okay. So that's all my goodbyes. Rachel, you want to say goodbye as well? I'll be the same. She said it in German. Bye, Bex. Sorry you missed the stream. Bye, Bex.